Welcome, President Akande. Hello. How are you guys doing? Thank you for Good. having me this afternoon. I appreciate it. Yeah, we haven't met yet. Um, yes. I've, I've had a couple of near misses where I've been on uh, Champlain prior to the pandemic where I was doing things on Champlain campus, but good to, good to meet you. Thank you for good, having me. Good to see you, Richard. You too, sir. Senator, how are you? Good. And Susan, nice to have you with us. And Sophia. Hi. Um, so uh, looks like we're uh, streaming now. So Senate Education, September 15th, um, just uh, two weeks or less than two weeks left until adjournment, uh, finally, of the 2020 session. So um, I, I just wanted to begin by clarifying where we are today in the process, what we're doing and what we're not doing. So at our last meeting, we semi-finalized some language uh, for actual inclusion in the budget. And um, we didn't vote that out, but we sent it over with our unanimous opinion to appropriations. I sat in with them and um, talked about it. They um, accepted everything we did. Um, so they're moving forward with that draft the full uh, 53 million for K through 12, the expanded 7 million for HVAC, um, and then all of the policy pieces. There was sort of a surprise in that Senator Ash um, mentioned the after school task force, because as all of you probably know, the tax and regulate conference committee is coming to a a close and one of the things that the house insisted upon was dedicated money for after school from tax and regulate so it looks as though that will be part of the deal ideally the house would have passed our after school task force in march uh, when we got it over to them or i think even earlier they didn't so senator ash suggested that it go into the budget along with our other stuff um, and I uh, assented to that. The House has now said that they're okay with that. So that will go in uh, right after the pieces that we approved. Today, what we're doing is looking to draft a letter from Senate Ed to appropriations about a number of different things. We're gonna be starting with the House's recommendation of $10 million for the independent colleges. Um, we'll also go to uh, a piece of language that Senator Ingram and I developed for UVM's piece in the budget. Um, obviously, the committee hasn't seen that yet, uh, nor has UVM. So it's important to get everybody's opinion on that. Uh, and then um, what is the other piece that I'm forgetting? Outright. What's that, Debbie? Outright Vermont. Oh, outright Vermont uh, and the bridge funding. That's bridge right. Funding. Those have both already been dropped into the budget. The Appropriations Committee did their own testimony on those topics, and they're already clear on those. Um, let's, if we can, start with uh, Susan Stitely. And Susan, I'll, I'll ask you to um, maybe introduce the topic and then go to your witnesses as you prefer. Um, but I will say that in speaking with the Appropriations Committee, and I'm going to read this because I don't think anybody has it handy, but in the House passed budget, there was the sum of $10 million to be distributed among independent colleges. And this is the wording that goes with it. It says, to the agency of administration, $10 million for equitable distribution. And I flag that on behalf of appropriations. They're wanting to drill down into equitable. And that would be determined in consultation with AVIC among the 11 independent colleges. In order to qualify for funding from this appropriation, Colleges must be a Vermont state chartered school. 
The funds are for the costs associated with technology for remote instruction, PPE, cleaning, and room and board refunds when students were sent home due to COVID-19. So there were two concerns from the Appropriations Committee that they asked us to ask you. One was, um, here it allows the Agency of Administration working with AVIC to develop a quote unquote equitable distribution. Um, so one question that they had was, wasn't there a formula that was used for, I believe the 1.5 million that went out in a previous budget? And could we use that formula rather than developing a new one? And then the second thing is, uh, Senator Ash in particular was wondering about the $10 million round number. Um, he wanted to drill down into that and find out exactly how uh, precise a determination that was, or was it a, a ballpark? So um, Susan, with those questions and concerns in mind, feel free to um, order the testimony of yourself and your witnesses as you will. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Baruth, uh, and thank you for inviting me. And I am pleased to have Sophie, President Sophie Hallett here and President uh, Benjamin Akanda here as well. We really appreciate all you have been doing. I know you've been working 24 seven uh, and um, it's been amazing work that you're doing. Uh, and also just wanna mention that I have pre we do appreciate the past support that you gave us in particular the work that Senator Hardy did in June uh, for possible funding for testing relief. Um, and uh, I think maybe it's best if I address right away, Senator Baruth, the, uh, the, the language that you brought up since you mentioned it. Uh, Jeannie, do you have what I sent you so that the, the committee members can see it, the memo that I uh, sent for today? Yes, it's posted on our website. Um, if you, can you access it or do you want to have it brought up on the screen so that you can all see it? I'll let Senator Baruth respond to that. Uh, Jeannie, I don't find it under today's documents. I don't, mm. I don't see anything. It, it is. is you, it? you maybe should refresh. Yeah, because I just pulled it up. Okay, one second. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, and so this would be the AVIC request? Yes, this is the AVIC request. Uh, okay. It is re revised from uh, what we gave the House in that we've changed the language that the House proposed. Uh, and maybe we want to just go directly to the second page where you will find what we are, we're proposing to address some of the concerns that you mentioned, Senator Baruth. Yeah. Um, so on page two, section three, it now says to the agency of administration, $10 million for equitable di distribution to be turned in co consultation with AVIC and among the 11 colleges. First, uh, the 10 million was what um, JFO suggested. They said there would be no more money than 10 million for us. We would love to have asked for more, but uh, that was all that was available. And we have had over 144 million dollars of losses, which you can see further down uh, on the sheet. So one safeguard is that this discussion will be with AOA uh, as far as the equitable dis distribution, but we have added language that uh, to let you know what we would like to consider, the factors that we would consider including but not limited to. The CARES Act funding guidelines, which is what you referenced, uh, Senator Bruth, um, but that, that gives out funding based on only on FTE and benefits the largest institutions with the most students. Uh, and we don't think that is equitable. So we would like to add some other uh, parameters around that, creating a floor to protect the smaller schools and also to consider endowment size. And there may be other factors as we get into the discussion of it with AOA and the independent colleges that we may be want to add to make sure that it is an equitable distribution. So uh, in addition to that, we add a language that the institutions must be accredited. Uh, before that was not in there, although it's a charter. Mm -hmm. And rather than having the previous categories that you mentioned, the PPE costs, the um, remote instruction costs, we're asking that the funds for the COVID-related 19 losses and expenditures uh, meet the federal guidelines for funding eligibility. You know, all the colleges are so different. So we have colleges that have no PP, 
e-costs. We have some that have no remote learning costs. Uh, so, and they really vary on what it is they would need reimbursed for. So putting in that language that it has to be with the eligibility of federal guidelines makes it broad enough that everybody can get reimbursed for what they may need, not uh, categories. It makes, you know, for example, some of the schools, the smaller schools in particular that didn't bring any students back, don't have testing costs, don't have cleaning costs, don't have PPE costs. Mm -hmm. So um, this would allow for everyone to get uh, more of an equitable distribution based on their losses and expenditures. Okay, so, um, all right, why don't, why don't we hear from uh, the, the uh, two presidents that you've um, brought with you today uh, in, in any particular order? Oh, Sophie Hallett, why don't you go first? My apologies, I was muted there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Susan. And um, thank you to this committee. Um, and thank you, Chair Baruf, as well. Um, greetings from Southern Vermont. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all at this extremely um, challenging time for the School for International Training, or SIT, and for all of Vermont's independent colleges due to COVID-19. I also want to thank this committee for considering the House of Representatives recommendation of relief funding for our independent colleges. These are extraordinary times. Thank you for considering extraordinary measures. I am Dr. Sophia Howlett, president of SIT in Brattleboro. SIT was founded in 1964 and is an accredited higher education institution. SIT is an active member of ABIC. According to Vermont Department of Labor, we are the largest vocational and training school in the state. We're the largest institution of higher education in Windham County and the sixth largest employer, according to Think Vermont. We believe in the power of diversity, the importance of an intercultural perspective and fostering openness and understanding. Through our graduate institute based in Vermont, our semester-long study abroad programs across the world, and our certificate for professionals, SIT prepares students to be effective leaders, professionals, and citizens. Unlike some of our fellow AVIC members, SIT is a non-traditional higher education institution. Most of our students do not physically reside on our campus, and our activities extend from high schoolers all the way through our students' professional careers. However, like all our fellow members, we rely heavily on tuition-based revenue to transform the lives of young Vermonters. Our alumni are community leaders helping each day to make Vermont a better place for all of us. They include Rick Burkfield, the co-founder and executive director of Food Connects, H.B. Lozito, Executive Director of Out in the Open, which connects and empowers rural LGBTQ people in Vermont. And Stephen Gillen, President and Co-Founder of the Windham County Chapter of the NAACP and a member of the Governor's Racial Equity Task Force. As a trailblazing and quintessentially Vermont organization dedicated to promoting international education, our business model is in the bullseye of COVID-19. As the pandemic began to spread, we found ourselves racing to bring home more than 900 students from 36 countries at an added cost to the organization of over $650,000. SIT is no stranger to world wars, civil wars, and natural disasters, but COVID-19 has been a truly unprecedented challenge. Financially, we work quickly in March to respond to that challenge, stewarding our money effectively to prepare for a difficult fall, including participating in the Federal Payroll Protection Program. But now, here we are in September. And as we are all very aware, good stewardship and an effective business model has limits in our present context. In fiscal year 2019, our tuition-based revenue was $48.4 million. 
this fiscal year, our expected tuition-based revenue is $3.5 million, a 93% drop in revenue due solely to COVID-19, as we are unable to send young Americans on our transformational programs. SIT's revenue losses have been the highest among AVIG members, accounting for roughly a third of the total lost revenue. Our consequent restructuring efforts have directly affected 52 of our Vermont staff, and we now have 130 employees based in Vermont supporting our mission and programs. Despite this, SIT remains a significant employer and economic driver in Southern Vermont. Indeed, our independent colleges together employ over 9,000 people. Our combined AVIC revenue losses amount to over $144 million, and SIT alone is in need of $5.6 million in relief as this crisis extends towards winter and spring. None of us have been eligible for relief from the state before, despite this serious need. As you know, the House has recommended $10 million in coronavirus relief funding for the independent colleges. Clearly $10 million divided among AVIX 11 members will not solve all our problems, but it will certainly be critical, especially combined with the ongoing individual efforts to restructure and cut costs. We all recognize this is a time of extraordinary disruption and transition. It's vital for our survival to adapt. SIT is doing just that. And at the same time, we are guided by our good neighbor policy. We have reached out to Windsor County at a time of economic devastation to bring our talents and experience home. We have set up virtual internships and are partnering with the Community College of Vermont and others to support workforce development. We have partnered with state and local officials to provide dormitory space for exposed first responders and frontline health workers, and offered backup to the Department of Children and Families for daycare and after school services. Even as we struggle with serious revenue losses and remain very concerned about the prospect of further layoffs, we continue to look for ways to help our community, even as we look to you all for a helping hand. Thank you again for the opportunity to share with your committee a snapshot of how COVID-19 is affecting SIT. And thank you for considering urgently needed relief of $10 million for Vermont's independent colleges. I strongly believe, and I hope you do as well, that we are vital to the economic health and success of our state now and in the future. Thank you, and I'm ready to answer any questions. And you will also find an attached financial statement of our losses to date. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we could probably hold questions until we've uh, heard from President Akanda. Um, let's, let's do that. Uh, President Akanda, I have to say you have the most impressive Zoom background of anybody that I've seen in the last six months? Well, I, I want to thank you for that. I, um, I, 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 my kids have been really good to me. They, uh, they keep giving me all these really nice uh, background. And so I'm, I'm, I'm using them. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to thank you for inviting me this afternoon and for your leadership and and our work in supporting Vermonters during this remarkable time um, in our history. Uh, what we have found is that um, the COVID pandemic is an equal opportunity pandemic that has impacted every single one of us, but more so it's, it's impacted higher education more than ever. Um, I'm Benjamin Ola Akande, uh, president of Champlain College. I, I began my tenure on July 1, but I've been engaged with Champlain since my announcement on April 20th. And I've been fully engaged in leading our return to campus for preparation and execution. You know, all over the news, we have seen that universities and colleges um, have become hotbeds for virus transmission. 
that is not the case for Champlain or any one of my counterparts uh, as part of um, our organization. Our success has many benefits. More satisfactory education for students and parents, minimizing the adverse economic effects of isolation and quarantine, decreasing the adverse psychological e effect of isolation and showing the rest of the country and perhaps the world that this can be done, but it comes with an investment cost. Our COVID mitigation plans have been extensive and comprehensive. They include aggressive testing protocols, modifications to our facilities, cleaning, disinfecting, and much more. We reduced the number of students brought back to campus by more than 30% this fall to de-densify de 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 our residence halls and also to reserve space for quarantine and isolation. I am pleased to share with you that our plan is working. And as of today, we have conducted more than 4,000 tests with only one positive case, giving us a positivity rate of 0.02%, well below that of Vermont, let alone the rest of the nation. We have made the necessary investments to enable our students to return to campus safely and to protect the health and safety of our community. But they have come at a great cost and the private colleges have been affected just like our public college colleagues when it comes to pandemic related costs. Champlain has incurred an estimated $12 million in pandemic related losses. This includes our investments in testing of more than $2 million, $2.5 million in losses from room and board uh, that there was a refund from last spring and another loss from the shift to remote instruction cost from PPP supplies, cleaning, and much more. Champlain College and its peers in the higher education sector play an important role in our state's economy. You know that. And we contribute to the economic vibrancy of this community. We are all employers and importers of talent. We educate Vermonters and recruit students to Vermont from around the country and perhaps around the world. And many of our graduates join Vermont's workforce and contribute further to our economy, a way of paying it forward. So we, we appreciate the work of the committee and we appreciate what you did in June to try to ensure potential funding for the private college regarding testing. Today, we, we ask again for your support and strongly urge you to retain the $10 million allocation for independent colleges for COVID related funding within the fiscal year 21 restarted state budget. We believe that the strong private and public higher education sector means a strong Vermont for us all. And we believe that at the end of the day, our response to COVID epidemic has been so successful that essentially it has become a competitive advantage for this state. And that we can all say without hesitation that coming to Vermont to go to college it's the safest thing that you can do in America today. That is a success factor. I thank you. Great, great point. Um, and I know that uh, some, I, I think President Hallett uh, mentioned, or Susan Stitely mentioned Senator Hardy's um, urging on the testing. That was part of the idea behind that is to make sure that um, our higher education system writ large was ready for the, the wave of students coming back. Um, questions for either of those uh, two presidents or for Susan Stitely? Senator Hardy. Thank you. Um, and absolutely what my concern was in June was to make sure that we um, had the resources for your institutions to be able to test students and staff and faculty as colleges reopened. And I am incredibly grateful that the institutions um, took that path and have a very rigorous um, testing protocol and that was certainly my intention in recommending funding in in June. 
However, I'm not so keen on the expanded request now and the direction it's taken. Um, I do have a question specifically for Sophia um, or Sophia, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, it was unclear um, to me how many students you have on campus um, at this time, or if you're running any of your programs at, at all. Um, I was not clear in your testimony. So thank you for that, Senator Hardy. We have no students on campus right now. Um, the students that we normally bring on campus are, are either our graduate students during um, large parts of the year, or also we have a lot of youth programs and exchange programs. So obviously we went the very safe route of moving our graduate students who were already in a kind of hybrid low res program. We moved that completely online. And then um, our exchange and youth programs simply haven't been able to happen because those are students coming from other countries. Um, and then in terms of uh, other students, we do actually, and I consider this a major success, we do actually have 28 students right now um, in Iceland and Rwanda. Um, uh, but that's all we've been able to do out of a normal year of, normally this semester we'd have about 850 to 900 students overseas with us. Okay. So this is the scale of our problem, yes. So you're 40, it's about 40, I'm looking at your financial sheet that you presented with your testimony, about $44 million in revenue loss is due to your tuition loss for these programs that you're not being able to run. Exactly, so, we simply, you, sorry. Uh, so, so for you and your institution, it's mostly a revenue problem, not an expense problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's not just, it's actually both. Um, because uh, in terms of we, we still, just because we don't have programs running, we obviously want to maintain our staff and our faculty um, because we're aiming to have programs back very soon. And so we have really kind of reoriented ourselves to try and maintain our staff. Um, and as I mentioned, we still have uh, 130 staff members um, around our campus here in Brattleboro. Um, who are working for us, uh, despite the fact that we don't have students overseas. So we have expenses and we have revenue losses. Right, but your the impact, the direct impact based on this financial sheet you provided, the, the vast majority of the impact is revenue loss, not yes. expense related. Yes. Um, and, and President Akande, um, you said you had a a 30% reduction in the number of students on campus. So uh, about 70% of your normal um, student population is actually present in Vermont. Is that correct? Did I understand? Yes, currently we, we have about, um, let me give you the exact number there, they're on our campus um, as, as of today. We're looking at 850 students in our Champlain campus housing right now. And how many you normally have? We we probably we probably have double that, um, and what has happened is that as a result of our de-densification de process, you know, going from um, you know two in a room to one in a room to four in a quad to one you know in the quad, we we we've, we've been very cautious about that, and that that is essentially cost. Um, um, that's that's been a, a significant loss to us. Um, uh, over over time, so our our impact has been both from the expense side, and and also from the revenue side. If you want me to do give you a breakdown, I'd be more than happy to do so. Well, yeah, I mean, I I, I love the breakdowns. I love the the financial sheets, but I, I was just trying to get a sense of how many students you had back, and and you said sure. you had a thirty percent reduction in your student population, but now you just said fifty percent. So no, what 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 we're talking about? You said on campus because yeah. we, we, we also have students that are off campus. Um, okay. that, that did not come back, that they, right. they came back, but they're not staying with us. They have found accommodation elsewhere. So that I was just trying to give you a, an ideal, um, you know, the, the exact numbers of what we're looking at. Okay, so about 50% of your normal population is on campus. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Um, so, I mean, you know, I've heard um, comparisons for the private, in the private colleges to both other institutions of higher education and also other businesses. And um, I, we have obviously provided um, a pretty um, 
good amount of revenue for our public institutions, um, UVM, and I look forward to hearing from Mr. Kate about what they're doing, and also the state colleges. Um, and uh, you know, to this point, we haven't yet provided anything to the private colleges. But and when we look at, as, at you as businesses, at the businesses in the state that we have provided grants to, we've only, the highest number, the amount of grant we've provided is only $100,000 for um, our businesses in the state. And so it's, if, you're, if you're trying to make the argument that your businesses, um, this would be a far greater amount of money for you than for our regular businesses in the state. We also have only um, covered their revenue losses, not their expenses in most cases, except for with a few exceptions. Um, so I, I'm much more um, sympathetic to uh, Ms. Howlett talking about their revenue losses than, than the expenses of bringing camp, uh, students back to campus. And, and while I laud the private colleges and, and the colleges for their ability to bring students back um, with very few cases, the fact is that they decided to bring students back and they incurred those costs because of that decision when they could have made the decision to bring fewer students back to campus and therefore incur fewer costs. Um, so I'm much more sympathetic to provide to providing aid for revenue loss rather than expenses um, based on a decision, a risky decision to bring students back. I also, and, and Susan mentioned this, um, there, are, there are at least two independent colleges that have significant endowments. And I am not keen on providing state funding for businesses, private businesses with huge financial resources. Most of the largest businesses in our state did not get state funding. Um, they did get some federal funding, but the, the, this funding I would much prefer when we define what equitable is, is, is going toward the institutions that have less financial um, security and, and, and smaller endowments um, to rest on. Um, I just, it's just not an equitable thing to give um, state funding to an institution with a $1.1 billion endowment. And I will say that as I represent them. Um, and uh, there, is, there are others that have large endowments too. Um, so I would prefer that we really scale this down and really define it a lot better, what equitable is and what, what we're actually covering. Um, because a lot of these expenses were, as I said, because of choices made for the number of students they brought back, not required expenses. Can I, can I chime in briefly? Absolutely. Um, um, Senator Hardy, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your, your concern and your assessment. I, let me suggest to you that when, when it comes to endowments, um, I think people tend to misunderstand um, that endowments are essentially available to, to be consumed and utilized for anything that um, when, when, those, when those needs come up. And for for an individual that I've had the honor to be, to, to serve as president of two, two, two institutions. I, I can say to you, ma'am, that one of the things that gets colleges in, in trouble is when they use their endowments for things that it was not meant for. The very essence of endowments is very restricted funding. Many, in many instances, scholarships um, for funded professorships. And so when you start dipping into endowments that are not meant for, for things for which they were obligated, you put, just, you put your institution in legal limbo. And so I, I'm, I'm not defending anybody. I'm just saying to you that I think it's important that you understand that dynamic and the strictness that comes with those, um, the, 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 the purposes and intent of endowment. Second, on, on the issue of, of expenses versus revenue, you know, I, I think throughout the process of this summer and, and engaging with the governor, engaging with Dr. Levine and, and really working with our, our, our government entities, the decisions that we made in returning to the fall were not isolated decisions. They were decisions that were made in consultation with our state uh, counterparts, the, the leadership, uh, the government, um, who, who encouraged that we do what we can, but we do it within the reason of strong medical and health uh, awareness in returning to the fall. And so we felt an obligation. And, and the obligation is that indeed, if we're going to return in the fall, that we do so responsibly. 
and we do so without putting our students in in arms way now ma'am if you were if you could if you were in a situation that now a couple of weeks into the semester the cases of covid has has just just been astronomical and spread i would say that we haven't done a good job at that but I, but i think to an extent ma'am we we've been we've been very successful to the point where we've become the ultimate benchmark in this country for how to mitigate viruses and pandemic and and the expenses that we've incurred i mean expenses because we we follow directives we we follow the regulations we played by the rules of the game we've done everything that we can to make sure that first and foremost it is about the welfare and the safety of our students faculty and staff and by extension our community and and then what we're saying is that give us the same level of respect and support that you will give to our public counterparts we're all in this together we're trying to educate the next generation of of of, of americans and vermont vermonters and so when you when you look at our cost for instance um the the, the revenue loss that we've had for for for, for my institution um for fiscal year 2021 lost revenue um is 6.7 million dollars for fiscal year 2021 estimated expenses we're talking about 2 million dollars um for fis and that that expense a significant portion of that is supplies of ppes covid testing um you know um you know apps for for social um for, to be able to to for social tracing um you know and and things that are necessary to keep our communities safe you know i end with this there's a cost associated with responsibility so um and we, were willing, I, I we were willing to take that cost and we do it because not, it's not just about us it's also about the community that we represent and for someone that came from Missouri, um, that has seen the level of less attention to details as I've seen in in Champ in air in, air in uh, Vermont, I am so proud to be a member of this community. I'm so proud to be a member of this state for what you guys represent. You guys are the new benchmark. We are now the new benchmark because I'm now a member of it about, about how good things are done. And I would say that you send a very clear message, not just to Vermonters, but to the, to the nation that you care about higher education and that the, and, and the consequences of this will be more students coming to us in the future because they know that we care and they know that we're taking care of our own. I thank you. Uh, Senator Hardy, uh, you wanted to respond? Yes, thank you, Senator Baruth. Um, um, uh, President Akande, um, I, I completely agree with you that your colleges um, did a good job of uh, an excellent job of making sure that students were brought back safely and that the, um, it, the consequences of, of an irresponsible um, protocols were not um, at least yet, um, the semester has just begun, um, uh, uh, have not spilled into the communities. And I, I am grateful that you and um, others um, were responsible. However, you made the choice to bring students back in person and therefore to incur those costs. The alternative would have been to bring fewer students back and therefore incur fewer costs. So that was the choice that I was discussing. I would never suggest that you should make the choice between bringing students back irresponsibly and bringing students back responsibly. Um, so, but, but you incurred a cost because you brought students back um, when the alternative would be, be more remote students. And to your um, point about endowments, um, I know this is their first time before the committee and you don't know me, but I have worked directly with college endowments and I know exactly how they um, function. Um, so um, I, I also know that, that colleges have more flex, many, not all have, colleges have more flexibility with their endowments than they will let on in. Uh, so thank you. Um, Susan, I, I will um, go to you. I, I would like uh, to try to move on to our UVM uh, piece and Richard Kate, but feel free to respond. 
Oh, I, I can appreciate Senator Hardy's concerns and I um, agree with, of course, President Akande. I did just want to give a few more details about the endowments. There's only one institution, Middlebury College, that has a higher endowment than UVM. Uh, and two of our uh, institutions have a less of an endowment than CCV has. So most of our institutions are, do not have high, enormous endowments to rely on. Um, and to address that matter, particularly, we put in the new um, proposed language that endowment size would be considered because we definitely want to consider that and the institutions that have endowments want to consider that as well. So we hope to address that issue um, with that new language that I hope that you will consider. So um, we are of at least two minds about this because I favor the House recommendation um, for reasons that I'll lay out later when the committee has our discussion. Um, but what I'd like to do is uh, hear from Richard Kate, take a look at the language that uh, was drafted around financial transparency, and um, then try to reserve time for the committee to discuss among itself what, what we'd like to do. We have three options on the uh, independent college funding. One is to um, support the House recommend. One is to try to change the House recommend. And the other is to not address it at all. Um, and we'll, we'll see where we land. But uh, welcome, Richard Kay. And um, Richard, I'm wondering uh, if you had a chance to look at what is posted on our website. Um, there's a document there that includes the paragraph about financial transparency. Have you, have you? Uh, well, I, I, I actually was not aware uh, that it was something I should have looked at. Right? I, oh, okay. Um, under, was, Debbie, under Debbie Ingram's name, you'll see it says memo. Um, and if you click on that, it, um, it addresses a couple of different issues. Um, but this, this set of paragraphs came out of testimony that we had earlier in the session. Um, responses from faculty and staff around uh, the ways in which UVM was going about dealing with the pandemic financial um, follow on. And there, um, I would say you could sum their concerns up under two headings. One I would call progressivity. Um, and I think the university has done work on the progressive nature of their response to the cuts. The other was uh, transparency. And so what you see here does not address their complaints about progressivity because some of the actions the university has taken fall under that heading. Um, but you'll see that there's language suggested, and I'll just read it. Therefore, Senate education requests that the following language be included in the appropriations bill as a particular obligation to make it transparent. That obligated as the state's efforts to stem UVM's financial losses, the COVID-19 emergency have expanded. For the duration of the governor's order, appropriations, and education committees, as well as the UVM community, family accounting of all funds appropriated and covered by the governor's emergency orders and the revenue loss projections upon which the university's present and future budget cuts are premised as actual data becomes available. And that's speaking to two uh, related um, concerns that we, uh, people working on the UVM campus felt that they weren't privy to financials, but also weren't privy to what the projections were that um, were driving the cuts and how those projections would eventually jibe with financial reality. Um, so I realize that was your first look at that. It is also some of the committee members' first look. Um, so would you, would you prefer to speak to that language, Mr. Kate, or would you rather um, speak generally to the university's response 
to COVID first? Well, I can go to the language. Obviously, all of our records are public record and, and thus are, yep. I think, um, as I think, I try to think about what people uh, were or are looking for that we haven't had. You know, I have, uh, I, the president, the provost have spoken to innumerable groups on campus in regard to, uh, as recently as just uh, yesterday, I was describing in detail um, the information that appears on the sheet that uh, uh, I had provided for they and, and had provided earlier in September, the details where we've spent the money we've gotten thus far and, and what's been allocated. Because uh, a faculty member yesterday um, uh, was asking me if the headline they had read somewhere was true that the university had already received $80 million in COVID relief funding. And I had to disavow of that. And then I went through very carefully the, the 8.7 we got for FY20, the 19 million we received thus far, and the fact that the legislature was concerned currently considering 10. So we're always happy to do that. The, the bottom line, of course, is, is, is every day the numbers are changing uh, as we go forward. So um, I don't really see any problem providing that. The only, the only question uh, would be the, the vehicle by which that occurs or and the timing. You know, is this, for instance, a monthly report that the university would produce uh, uh, mm -hmm. the expectation because uh, obviously we, we uh, and then we move forward to the next month and that sort of thing so uh, or you know is on a quarterly basis uh, but uh, I if I think it would be good to stipulate what it is we're required uh, to do in that regard in term otherwise people will think well that means every day you're going to give me your latest numbers type and, and that what, it, what about if it said a full specific quarterly accounting? I think that'd be perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, with that, um, are there uh, are there other areas you'd like to hit in your testimony, Mr. Kay? I, I think um, you know with our. Um, numbers that we've provided in the past. Uh, the, the I've heard a discussion here about the break between revenue loss and, and then expenses. Obviously, we're restricted to some degree by the CARES Act requirements in terms of what you can spend CARES Act money on. So we're trying to be very careful with that. But you know, right now, we're, we're projecting a, a um, a revenue loss uh, just in uh, net tuition of over $20 million. We're probably down $7 million for the year on uh, room and board. Uh, so we're, we're in that in that ballpark. And then meanwhile, I, I, I won't describe, uh, but we've detailed all the costs we've incurred in terms of refunds, technology enhancements for classrooms for online education, um, uh, testing, uh, we do have a very rigorous testing program, of course. We're testing, mm -hmm. testing students weekly. We tested them before they arrived. Uh, our incidence rate uh, thus far, if the net positive is 0.06%, uh, uh, so it's very, very low. Uh, we have taken you know, uh, over 250 uh, students uh, can be isolated depending on the need. Uh, we haven't needed anywhere at many, but we've we took one oh, entirely offline for that purpose, mm -hmm. and we have a little backup. So, uh, you know, we, we've been doing all the things you've heard about from, uh, from the presidents, and uh, I don't need to keep you long. It's just uh, we, were, we were asked uh, what, what, would it, uh, what would it take to help further fill the gap, uh, and we did some calculations and came up with the $11 million the house, the house, uh, as you said, uh, put forward the tent. Can, can I ask, Mr. Kate, so this speaks back to uh, Senator Hardy's point about the decision to bring students back. Can you just give us a sense from UVM's perspective, what, what were the trade-offs you considered 
when I'm sure you considered at some point a fully remote semester or year, what, what were the trade-offs when you made that decision? We considered the matter very deeply, very extensively, and very thoroughly. Um, I think in the first instance, obviously, we, we thought long and hard about the health and wellness of the community, the state, and the students, uh, and all of our faculty and staff. What, what would be the best thing that would be? On the other side was the whole matter of we are a higher education institution in, uh, and most of our students uh, in survey data wanted to come back and their parents wanted them to come back. And so we wanted to try to address that desire uh, and we, then, you know, that then turns into the whole matter of uh, becoming a uh, revenue issue very quickly. Uh, because if, if UVM starts to look just like, and I'm not, I'm not trying to point at anybody, but other institutions that are out there that are online only all the time, uh, then students, especially out of state students, who are taking a very hard look at us in terms of the tuition they pay. Uh, because if they do not have the UVM experience on campus, it, it's very unlikely that uh, a fair number of them just probably would not come and we might lose them. Uh, so we wanted to benefit the students, but we also wanted to ensure the viability of the institution. Uh, we've always said that we were going to pursue this uh, based on the best recommendations of our uh, health professionals. Uh, we just uh, this morning had a conversation with President Coles and I and others with uh, two of our epidemiologist experts uh, from uh, UVM Medical Center and uh, we were on the faculty of the university. And this is, this is a type of analysis we go through all the time. So it was, it was a very deliberate action based on very deliberate analysis of, of the options. Mm -hmm. yet we were prepared to pull back if we thought that the health and safety of the people and students, faculty, staff, community were at risk. Thank you. Um, questions for Richard Kay about UVM. Okay, um, Senator Hardy. I just want to pull back a little bit on your, your contention that, you know, one of the decision-making things was that students and parents wanted to come back to campus. Um, there are thousands of students around Vermont right now that would like to be in school full-time, who would like to be able to go to kindergarten full-time, who would like to be able to go to high school full-time, and they're not able to because we are in a pandemic. And so I guess I would just push back on the entire higher education in our country and um, this, this idea that we needed to have students back in person um, rather than remote education. Um, I, I, I do laud the Vermont um, institutions for doing it better than anybody else in the country, but there was the option and there still is the option of remote higher education during a pandemic. And I, I find it incredibly frustrating to hear leaders of higher ins education institutions saying, well, that's what our students wanted, so we had to do it. That's what our, stu that's what our K-12 students want too, and our, and our K-12 parents want too, and we don't have that option. And so it's a huge inequity in our very own state. So Mr. Kate, I, I would push back on that strongly. You did other options. And if you can't make the UVM experience an excellent one, um, uh, regardless of the circumstances, then I think that's um, a, a shame. I, said, uh, I don't think I said that we had to do it because they wanted to. Uh, Senator Brooke asked me what were the things we considered. That was one of the things we considered. I think we do have an excellent online experience, but. Uh, uh, the people that are coming to the university, many of them walking out. But I understand it. Okay. 
Uh, all right. So, uh, Susan, was that a I request just, to speak? Yes. <laughs> I just also want to mention that uh, President Akande has to leave uh, in three minutes in case anybody has a question for him. I don't think we have any more questions. I will thank you for coming. Um, I, I think we have a much clearer idea of, of the scale of the need um, and also the, the reasoning behind a lot of what you've been doing. So I, I appreciate it very much. Um, please feel free to stay with us for committee discussion if you'd like. Also feel free to drop off because it is um, boring uh, for, for people who aren't uh, part of our, our small group. So um, thank you very much if you do drop off. Otherwise, we'll, um, we'll just go ahead uh, knowing that you're listening. Susan. So yeah, I would just like to say a few words in closing that yeah. I, I hope you'll look closely at how we redrafted uh, the language for this appropriation, because I feel that it's important that, you know, that is included because it considers and outlines a sense of the equitable distribution. And also the fact that it is allowing the institutions to go where they need it the most uh, and not be confined by a category where they may not have any uh, expenses. So I think we really need to broaden the language or we're gonna be doing a disservice uh, if you uh, agree to the appropriation uh, to the smaller yep. and all the colleges. Yeah, speaking only for myself, I like that language better than what was in the house uh, version um, because it, it does some of the work rather than just leaving it to the agency of administration. Um, so committee, we're, um, we have about a half an hour and I wanna just clarify where we are. So again, Outright Vermont, which was gonna be part of our letter and the bridge funding for the state colleges, um, the appropriations committee considers themselves uh, already decided to include those. So I think having our support in this letter for those is fine, but it, it is uh, redundant in, in a way. Um, so what we're really talking about uh, is the language around UVM, which I was pleased to see Richard Kate supported with that one friendly amendment. Um, so let's start there quickly. Is there, is there anybody who didn't like that language around UVM transparency? Okay, anybody have a problem with making it quarterly, uh, that report? That would go up on our website, uh, house website, appropriations, et cetera. Okay, so, so we'll do that. Now to the question of um, the independent colleges and the house uh, recommend of 10 million. Um, so I, I, uh, I will open it to whoever would like to speak to it. I, I'll reserve my own comments for a minute, but anybody uh, want to speak to that question? Yeah, Andrew. I have a, I have a question first about, I don't, I don't know if I've seen the language, the house language you talked about, or have I seen it? And I just- uh, it's, it's in the house pass budget. I read it, but I can read it again. It's just the short. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty short. So, it's on page 96 of their house pass budget, but I'll read it. To the agency of administration, $10 million for equitable distribution. That's the phrase that appropriations was wondering about. Determined in consultation with AVIC among the 11 independent colleges. Now, Susan pointed out they have a new, new formulation for that. Uh, and maybe it's better to just, for us just to look at Susan Stitley's language. Do you have that in front of you, Andy? Yes. Um, because I, I really don't like the house language for a couple of reasons, but um, we have a couple of questions. One is the number and the other is, um, you know, how it's distributed, if it's distributed. So um, the house put in 10 million, which we heard testimony was I would put it that it is a round number, but rounded down from a much higher need. Um, so, 
as with the 32 million for K-12 that the House put forward, they did it according to what they could afford. Um, and so 10 million was the most the House felt they could afford of the ask. Um, so let's just talk about that number for a minute. Um, where do people fall? I said that I support it, and I'll just I'll just rough out my reasons. So um, I feel that this federal funding, we're being asked to act as uh, as a pass through, but not not a duty free pass through. We're supposed to be making intelligent, reasoned decisions about where it goes to um, to reduce the loss that people have felt. Um, having thought a lot about Vermont State Colleges and the bridge funding and their place as drivers of the economy, the number one thing for me is that we've seen three or four independent colleges go down and we've tried to shore up our oversight of their finances. We haven't done a lot to help their finances. Um, and I don't think we're going to do that anytime soon. This is an opportunity to try to stabilize these, call them job creating institutions in these communities with federal funds. It's not gonna make them whole, but it is going to um, substantially reduce their losses. So I can very easily make an argument to myself for the 10 million. Um, Ruth, I think um, is, and I don't want to speak for you, Ruth, but you, you seemed like you were arguing for a reduced amount or maybe no amount. Well, I, I, I'm just, it's hard for me to look at this just individual thing. Cause I, you know, I think, look, wondering how much, if we provided more funding for arts organizations, for example, um, uh, I'm looking at actually the quote that Susan included in her, in her testimony about the, the other areas that the econ our economist is suggesting we provide funding to and nonprofits or organizations and arts organizations, those were also some of my priorities and, and I had been advocating for more funding for them. So I don't know if they got more money. Um, so the 10 million just seems uh, somewhat random to me. I guess I would agree with Senator um, Ash in that I'm wondering what, how that was arrived at. I also would uh, like it to not um, be able to go to covering expenses, but rather just revenue losses and specifically tuition revenue losses. Um, some of these colleges have uh, uh, other types of revenue and I don't think we should be covering that. I'm, Sophia is the only one still on here and she would be a perfect person <laughs> institution for, for where I would like to target it, a small revenue well, losses and that kind of thing. So I, I like the language that would direct it more and, and really defining what equitable is. Um, the 10 million seems like a lot to me, frankly. Can, can I ask, because the federal uh, thrust has been to cover expenses and not revenue loss. So I'm, um, you've, you've. Um, I don't think so. With our business grants where they covered revenue loss. Well, like, like for loss. instance, sales tax loss, we're not allowed to cover for the state. Oh, for the state. But I'm, yeah. I was thinking about the business grants that we provided. Most of those cover revenue loss, not expenses. No, understood. But, but what I, what I mean is we've, we've been making lots of decisions about expenses and reimbursing expenses. Um, so I'm, I'm, this is the first time I've heard anybody really since the start of this talk about eliminating expenses as a category that we would reimburse. That's what we do in the business grants. But everywhere else we've been talking about uh, expenses and what, you know, what can we reimburse you for K through 12. Oh, I see what you mean. In K through 12. Yes, you're yeah. right. You're right. Debbie. It, it really depends on whether you look at it, you know, look at them more as education or as business. And I, they were making the ar argument that they're business, uh, businesses. Uh, but actually I had a question for Senator Hardy because you mentioned, uh, didn't you mention the a figure of like a hundred thousand dollars? Is that per, per business is like, is, is that like the average of what our businesses are receiving? No, most of our 
most of the businesses in our state, the maximum they can get is $50,000, regardless of the size of business. So most of them are getting far less than that um, with the grants through ACCD or through the tax department. Um, the maximum grant that I know of is actually for forestry businesses and those that grant program allowed for $100,000 um, in grants. Um, so, you know, AVIC has made both arguments as to their, with their businesses or their institutions of higher education. If you're looking at them just as businesses, then um, $10 million is way over funding them um, compared to what we are doing with other businesses in the state. So I was playing with numbers and thinking maybe we should do $250,000 might make sense. I don't know. Um, but but to, to Senator Bruce's point, if you're looking at them as institutions of education institutions, then that's more kind of um, uh, reimbursing expenses. However, you know, our, these colleges had the option of, of not bringing students back in person and doing remote education and not having all of the expenses that they had. So that's where I'm caught up with the whole expenses thing. They had another option and they didn't take it for the most part. Some of them did like um, SIT and Vermont Law School and others um, and others reduced dramatically the number of students, but not all of them did. And so that's what I don't want to say is we're going to re we're going to reimburse all of your expenses for bringing back most of your students students when they had another choice. Well, I, what I was trying to get at with my question to um, Richard Kate is if they had made the decision not to bring back any students, um, take UVM for instance, there's a, there's a, a massive revenue loss involved with that um, because it's not tuition based, but you know, all of the things that you are not providing, you have to still run the dorms, you have to still uh, you know, maintain this whole infrastructure throughout remote teaching. Otherwise, you have to begin the process of winding down the physical plant, laying off the people that work there, et cetera. So the decision to go fully remote, it's, it's not without its catastrophic financial consequences in certain instances, unless you're able to really, really um, go completely online, not lose a single dollar of tuition, and maybe dip into your endowment. Um, other, other folks that we haven't heard from yet. I'd support the investment. Uh, the the uh, House recommend? Yep. OK. Andy? Yeah, it's, it's hard for me. It seems like it, this is the job of the appropriations committee when you have all the different things if, if i knew what the money if it wasn't 10 million and it was 6 million what the other 4 million was going to then that would make a make it easier to decide but just saying it should be less or should it be more i don't feel like i have enough information yeah. to make that decision uh i i thinking of the being you know provincial about it thinking of the the colleges small colleges you know in my district you know, it's a huge thing for them and supporting them is going to support the businesses that kind of rely on them being around. So uh, I'm supportive of it in that regard. And I, and I, and I get uh, Senator Hardy's point I think is well taken. I know it's kind of what you were just saying, Senator Ruth, is that their revenue loss would have been pro for a lot of these schools would have been greater had they not taken on the expenses of bringing them back. So that was something that they were trying to, to walk a fine line with. Uh, so, so I guess in the end, I, I'm basically supportive of it because I don't have more information, but I would like, but I don't know, I don't have a good suggestion. Equitably, even I, I like the, the new stately language we can call it is, is better than the house language, but it's, we're still putting a lot of trust into the agency of administration, so. Yeah, I just, to uh and then i'll go to jim to the you know we've if we were to recommend less um that would be our recommendation to approach they could follow it or not follow it they'd be in a negotiation with the house anyway we don't know how strongly the house would support it what we do know is that we won't get any say into where money would go if we recommended less than 10 million 
Um, so our, our only um, value is just to determine whether we think it's, it's a, a good use of the money. Um, Jim. Well, in Rutland County, after losing two colleges, College of St. Joe's and Green Mountain College, and I think this is a good opportunity for us to help them uh, with a little bit of, um, it's a lot of money to us, but it's not a lot of money to the institutions. Uh, I'm good with the 10 million because that could easily go elsewhere. If we want to drop it five, the other five will disappear someplace else and it will, good chances are it might not go to education. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to keep it in uh, the 10 million in just as it is and I'm good with changing the language. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd be good with that, but I'm, I'm afraid that if we want to toy around with the amount, we're going to lose it. And who knows where it's going to go after that. It's going to be just disappear uh, someplace else. So I, I'd like to have a sure thing and knowing where the money's going to go and knowing that they're going to do uh, a good job with the money. Okay, Senator Ingram. I think Senator Hardy makes really good points. Um, and um, I mean, just looking at, at Susan Seitley's uh, memo, um, I mean, the if we think of them more in terms of uh, other educational you know, reimbursements for actual COVID related um, you know, measures, the, there's a $5.3 million figure uh, in her chart on page three, uh, which kind of makes a little more sense to me than the full 10. Um, and I mean, yes, it'll be spent elsewhere, but there are a lot of needs. Um, and um, yeah, I, I would be more comfortable with a lower amount also. Okay, I, I was not a math major, but I, I put it at four two um in support of the house recommend um have i misrepresented anybody's vote there so what i'm what i'm thinking we'll do is um uh i don't i don't want to go into great detail but i'm thinking that what what i will do is um add to our letter a line or maybe two lines that say we took testimony from avic um, explaining AVIC's explanation for how the 10 million was reached, offering Susan Stitley's new language and saying that, um, that uh, a majority of the committee supported the 10 million. Um, does that sound, uh, sound fair? Can I just ask a question, Phil? Um, sure. Which can you, Okay. Which Susan Stitely language are we talking about? Uh, be clear. So this is um, what she's got on that's page two. Yeah, at the bottom of page two. Of her bottom of page two. Those legislative language. And that um, it does, Ruth, it does speak to endowment size, which you had mentioned. Um, Senator Ash had pointed to CARES Act funding guidelines as something he was comfortable with. So it seems like this is um, moving very much in the direction that appropriations wanted. Um, okay, so if that sounds all right, then I, what I will do is I'll, um, I'll put all of these uh, small changes into one file and I'll have Jeannie send it to appropriations as our um, committee recommendation. Um, as far as Thursday goes, I was thinking about it this morning. I can't really think at the moment of any work we have to do Thursday. Um, that's not to say we, we can't uh, have hearings next week, but is there anything anybody feels urgently needs doing Thursday? Because we've, do, we've done our budgetary consideration of the House actual language. We'll have drafted our funding memo. Um, and as far as I know, you know, school is in the process of beginning. So I think it, it makes sense to wait until next week 
if we want to do oversight, just general oversight testimony about the first week of school, um, which I think would make sense before we adjourn. Can, so, can I yes, just ask, Claire? I just wanted to make sure I understood from the beginning. You were, did the appropriations committee are they good with the stuff we sent them last week? Yes, I, they are. Okay. In fact, they uh, added, as I said, Senator Ash added the uh, after school school task force language that we passed back in February. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, and if you remember, there was an amendment on the floor mm -hmm. to remove the um, reference to tax and regulate from it. Yes. Um, so that's the language that will go forward with no mention of tax and regulate. But as I said, the conference committee on S-54, the tax and regulate bill, the governor has insisted on, and the House has insisted on, a direct um, permanent funding source for after school that comes out of tax and regulate. Something could still blow up on that bill. Um, you know, it's, it's not at the finish line yet, it's close. And then it has to pass both bodies and get signed. But if so, that task force would be um, created in the budget, and then it would have six months from signing to produce the plan for spending the money. And the money won't start coming in for a year and a half or two years. So the timing should work out pretty well still. Um, yeah, Andy. Can I just ask for an update? What happened with the, the house language about the school deferred maintenance i thought at one point we did they put that in their budget they just that just dropped off uh so they sent it from their committee to i want to say ways and means or appropriations i think it was ways and means never moved um there was you remember a memo came out about must pass bills that the speaker and the pro tem agreed on and we only had one uh, sure about it. what's that I never saw it. I just oh. heard about it. Um, it was not very illuminating, and it turns out not to actually reflect what the House is prepared to do. Mm. So we had one bill on there, which was the health care bargaining language, which they agreed was must pass and then said they weren't going to pass it. <laughs> so that's, that's where that stands. Um, but at the very bottom of that, there was a kind of a miscellaneous list that said, something like to be decided or whatever. And that bill about school construction consultant was there. And then it said question mark in the budget. What I have said at this point to appropriations on the pro tem is that I think that should go through the regular process. That was like a million and a half for a consultant. That's frankly, that's the sort of thing that the house sometimes tries to drop in right at the end like a 300,000, 500,000, one and a half million dollar appropriation, almost always for consultants to do work in the off season. And I let Representative Webb know earlier on, if she wanted that bill to move, she should send it to us in the, in the normal course of things. So I, I would not personally say yes to that going in the budget because it's, it's too much outside the publicly illuminated process. Um, so thanks for today, everybody. We're, we're done a little early. Like I say, unless some major thing pops up, we won't meet Thursday. I'll, I'll leave the Zoom invitation in your boxes, um, but we all understand right now we're not gonna use it. Um, but, but if tomorrow Jane Kitchell handed me something, and said your committee has to look at this, I might send you an email and say, we're, we're going to need to meet Thursday. But for right now, no. Okay, see you soon.